This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We're in the series Haunted Homicide, where I tell you a true crime story and the subsequent haunting associated with the place the crime happened. This time, I'll be sharing with you a real tale of horror, just in time for Halloween. This true crime, from the early 1800s, became a well-known urban legend in America. The place where it occurred became known as the most haunted house in the United States. Join me as we travel to New Orleans for Chapter 3 and the story of Madame Delphine LaLaurie. On April 10, 1834, a fire broke out in the kitchen of a two-story mansion located at the corner of Rue Royale and Hospital Street in New Orleans, Louisiana. Flames quickly engulfed the kitchen and began to spread to the rest of the house. People from the neighborhood came running to help. They were well acquainted with the residents of 1140 Rue Royale, Dr. and Mrs. Louis LaLaurie. Madame LaLaurie was known for the extravagant parties she threw for the New Orleans social set. She was also known for her grace, beauty, and style. As the volunteers arrived, they witnessed Madame LaLaurie grabbing up valuables, silver sets, artwork, and antiques, before handing them to the men, ordering them to take them out of the house to save them from the flames. One neighbor who'd arrived to assist knew that the LaLauries had several servants who lived in the slave quarters attached to the rear of the house. Screams were heard coming from the kitchen where the fire had originated. There, the men found an elderly slave, the house cook. She could not escape the fire, as she was chained up near the stove. The fire was too hot, and try as they might, they could not rescue her. They watched her be consumed by the flames. Where are the rest of the slaves? One of the men shouted to the madam of the house. Never mind that, Delphine was said to respond. Save the valuables. Outside, bystanders heard screaming coming from the attic and yelled to the men, They're upstairs, in the attic. The men rushed down the hall, but were stopped by a locked door to the stairs. It was also being guarded by Dr. LaLaurie. Where are the keys, the men demanded. We have to let your slaves out before they perish. Dr. L. answered coolly, Some people would do better to stay home, rather than come into others' homes, dictating laws and meddling in their affairs. Firemen arrived and pushed past him to break down the door. The smoke was beginning to fill the second floor, but they were able to reach an attic room where terrified cries were heard. When they entered, they saw at least a dozen chained slaves. Some were naked, they were all emaciated, and some were nearly dead. But as horrific as that was, an even more horrifying scene was discovered. The chained slaves had been mutilated. A crisscross of angry-looking scars ran down their backs and legs. By the looks of them, they'd been made to suffer outrageous forms of torture and mutilation. One woman's skin had been stripped from her body in a spiral, so she resembled a macabre caterpillar. A man and a woman, found chained together by their necks, appeared to have undergone crude sex change operations. Her breasts had been roughly sewn to his chest, and his penis was sewed to her crotch. Another man chained to a wall had a hole drilled into his head. The wound had festered and was being consumed by maggots. Another female slave had her limbs broken, and they hung at odd angles from her body. She could only scuttle close to the floor like a crab. Other body parts were found strewn around the room. God only knew what hellacious experiments the poor souls those body parts belonged to had suffered. The rescuers could hardly believe their eyes. Some couldn't bear it and backed out of the room, running out of the house to wretch in the street. The slaves who were still alive were taken to the Cabildo, a local jail and slaveholding area. Some didn't live through the night. It was reported that some of the mutilated and starved survivors could not take the shock of receiving adequate food and liquids and lapsed into a coma before quickly dying. The others were housed on the bottom floors in cells that could be viewed from the street. Curious and disbelieving citizens 
filed past all night and into the next day to see the poor wretches for themselves. It was reported that over 4,000 people came to see the spectacle. Meanwhile, back at 1140 Rue Royale, a mob was forming. Once word reached the public about the atrocities that had taken place there, the people of New Orleans descended upon the house, calling for the blood of the Lalories. As they gathered, stories of other incidents that had previously occurred there were shared. The year prior, a 12-year-old slave girl named Nina was given the daily task of brushing her mistress's hair. One day, while doing so, she brushed at a tangle, pulling Madame Lalori's scalp. She flew into a rage, and the girl ran from her. Brandishing a bullwhip, Madame Lalori chased Nina up the stairs and onto the roof of the house, where she lost her footing during her attempt to escape the sting of the whip. She fell into the interior courtyard. Her head cracked upon the pavement, blood pooling around her small body. Lalori called for her servants to clean up the mess and get rid of the body. The poor slave girl was buried in a shallow grave near the property's well. The story was reported to the authorities, and Madame Lalori was made to appear before the court. Because the Lalories were prominent and wealthy citizens, the judge merely fined her $300 and had her ten remaining slaves taken away from her. However, she was able to have another relative buy them back, the same slaves found so horribly abused in the attic. The cook who died in the flames was reported to be the grandmother of young Nina. Distraught over her granddaughter's death and wanting to escape her tortured existence, she had deliberately set fire to the kitchen. As the crowd gathered around the house and shared their stories, a carriage arrived and stopped at the side door. Quickly, and without being noticed by the people who stood at the front of the mansion, Dr. and Madame Lalori slipped into the carriage. As the horse ran past, the astonished crowd noticed, too late, that the homeowners were getting away. They ran after it, hurling rocks and insults, but the horse was too fast. Before long, the carriage was out of sight. The enraged crowd turned back to the house. Police tried to keep the mob from entering, but they were outnumbered. The crowd entered and began destroying everything that had not burned in the fire, which had since been extinguished. Silk draperies and furniture cushions were shredded. Crystal glassware and china plates were shattered. Hatchets were taken to handcrafted and costly furniture. What could be carried up to the roof was then hurled over the side and smashed to bits in the courtyard. When all was said and done, the destruction of the Lori Mansion was almost complete. Only the roof and walls remained after days of the frustrated, angry mob's need to avenge the tortured, mutilated, and murdered slaves. Meanwhile, the Lalori's carriage reached the dock in the dark of night. Money changed hands, and a boat captain was persuaded to ferry them across Lake Pontchartrain. They landed in Mandeville, where they hid out for a few days before being transported to Mobile, Alabama, where they then boarded a ship to Paris. The monstrous Delphine Lalori, the socialite serial killer, had vanished. You guys don't know this about me, but I'm kind of a handbag connoisseur. I've been searching for the perfect tote or backpack that will look stylish and is also functional for all my personal and business needs. Well, the founders of Holly and Tanager were also searching for the perfect backpack tote to carry all their essentials, so they created one. Their new backpack tote, The Professional, has been created with the needs of the on-the-go, jet-setting, trend-setting people like you and me. Not only is it gorgeous, made of supple Italian leather luxurious to the touch, it's also available in five colors with beautiful gold accent hardware, and it converts easily from a backpack to a tote to a crossbody bag. It also takes your organization to the next level with five interior pockets for your phone, pens, business cards, and more, and even features a bottom zipper pocket separate from the main bag area, perfect for your gym clothes or whatever else you want to keep separate. And it's great for travel. I love the suitcase handle sleeve built into the back of the bag to slide over the handle of your carry-on or suitcase. So convenient. And it's roomy enough for your tablet, notebook, and even a 17-inch laptop. In addition to the professional backpack tote, Holly and Tanager offers other extraordinary everyday handbags you don't see every day. As a listener of Once Upon a Crime, you'll get 15% off your first order 
when you go to hollyandtanager.com slash once and use promo code once at checkout. That's hollyandtanager.com slash once. And don't forget to use promo code once at checkout. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Kopari. What do you think about each morning as you're getting ready for your day? Maybe it's getting your kids off to school, your work commute, etc. For me, it's wrangling three dogs and all that entails in the morning. What I don't think about is my deodorant. But since it's something you use on your body every day, I want to share with you a safer alternative. Kopari is the aluminum-free deodorant that really works. Kopari doesn't use aluminum that plugs up your sweat glands. It takes care of odor, keeping you fresh all day, without messing up your body's natural patterns. You want those sweat glands to release those toxins, the way your body is naturally intended to work, but without the odor that can cause. Kopari deodorant works by fighting odor with plant-based actives such as sage oil and coconut oil, and it even outlasts your longest days. It also doesn't leave a sticky white residue, just the sweet, subtle scent of fresh coconut milk that I love. And it's gentle on the skin because it's also free of silicones, sulfates, parabens, GMOs, and baking soda. And reordering is easy with a Kopari subscription. Just choose how often you want to receive it, and it will be shipped automatically. One less thing to remember. To check it out, go to koparibeauty.com slash once and save $5 off your first order when you subscribe. That's K-O-P-A-R-I beauty.com slash once. Once Delphine LaLaurie escaped her house of horrors, people began to speak out about her past and their belief that she had likely killed before. Dr. LaLaurie was her third husband. She had married very well twice before, and both husbands before had died mysteriously. Her first husband was a prominent government official in the Spanish-controlled colonial government of Louisiana. The explanation of his death was that he'd fallen ill while in Cuba on government business. He died, and Delphine had inherited his money and property. She was next wed to a wealthy businessman in New Orleans, Jean Blanc. They had two homes, one in the center of New Orleans and another outside of town called Ville Blanc. She began to entertain frequently, and the couple often hosted prominent government officials and dignitaries in their home. The Blancs had four children, but in 1818, Jean Blanc disappeared leaving Delphine with four children and all of his wealth. Rumors swirled that Delphine had a hand in the demise of both her wealthy husbands before meeting Dr. LaLaurie. The LaLaurie mansion had been destroyed by the mob, but the police were able to stop the crowds from completely raising it to the ground. The building still stood, and patrolmen were assigned to guard the house for weeks after the fire. While on patrol, they began to report strange noises coming from the empty home. One such noise was a strange scuttling across the floor, as if something with claws, like a crab, was moving across the marble floors. Also heard were moans, cries, and sometimes shrieks coming from just beyond the walls of whatever room was occupied. But upon investigation, it was discovered that the other rooms were completely empty. Curious locals who happened to be walking down Rue Royale sometimes looked up to the mansion's upper floor windows and saw the figure of a young girl peering back at them with haunted eyes before simply disappearing. Others caught glimpses of dark figures with iron collars affixed cruelly to their necks. The passersby would rub their eyes as if to convince themselves they were imagining things, but when they glanced back at the window, the shackled figure remained its mouth wide open in mid-scream. It was unsettling, to say the least. Over the years, the house was sold and resold, but each time, the new owners or tenants fled in terror or simply walked away due to the strange sights, sounds, and feelings they encountered within its haunted walls. After a time, no one was brave enough to occupy the house, and it fell into disrepair. Its boarded-up windows and crumbling facade lent to its reputation as the most haunted house in New Orleans. Would you dare to enter? Okay, so how did you like that ghost story? Well, I hope you did, 
because it is just that, a story, and a very embellished one. But you know me, I'm going to dig until I get the real story. And so now I will share with you who Madame LaLaurie really was and what she really did, and if the LaLaurie Mansion is really haunted. Trust me, there is still a real crime story here as well as some creepy tales and a possible real haunting. Stay tuned. When I'm not listening to podcasts, I love audiobooks. It's a great way to get my book fix while still being able to do other things, like driving, cooking, or walking my dogs. Audible has the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet, so there's always something great to choose from. If you've been enjoying my series Haunted Homicide, you might like the book You Think You Know Me, The True Story of Herb Baumeister and the Horror at Fox Hollow Farm by Ryan Green. And there are many more true crime titles to choose from on Audible. But you can also pick from an unmatched selection of audiobooks in fiction, biographies, mysteries, science fiction, romance, and so much more. Listening on Audible is great because you can switch seamlessly between devices, like your car, tablet, or on an Amazon Echo, and pick right up where you left off. Audible members get a credit every month good for any audiobook, regardless of price, and unused credits roll over to the next month. And if you didn't like your audiobook, you can exchange it. No questions asked. I love that. Plus, your books are yours to keep, unlike streaming or rental services. Start a 30-day trial and get your first audiobook free. Go to audible.com slash once or text once to 500-500 to get started. That's audible.com slash once or text once to 500-500. If you're a fan of Once Upon a Crime, you're probably always interested in finding out what really happened in the true crime stories you've heard. If that sounds like you, then you need to check out a great new podcast called Hostage. Each episode of Hostage examines the tactics used by the FBI's Crisis Negotiation Unit, identifying moments where things went wrong, as well as the techniques that miraculously saved lives. The research and storytelling in Hostage is top-notch. It brings you into the heart of the action, providing listeners with a behind-the-scenes view of the negotiations the public doesn't get to see. You can listen to the three-part episode on the Patty Hearst kidnapping right now, a case I've been fascinated with for a long time. Upcoming episodes will cover the Iranian hostage crisis and the Moscow theater case. New episodes come out every Thursday, so subscribe today so you don't miss one. To listen to Hostage, visit Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and search for Hostage, H-O-S-T-A-G-E, or visit parcast.com slash hostage to start listening now. That's parcast, P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com slash hostage to listen now. Marie Delphine McCarty was born in 1775 in New Orleans to a wealthy, socially prominent family. She descended from Irish nobles and French Creole stock. She and her two brothers were raised on a plantation located just north of the city of New Orleans. Delphine, as she was most commonly called, was described as very beautiful, gracious, and charming. She was presented into society in her mid-teens and courted by the sons of New Orleans' most eligible bachelors. She did not marry until the age of 24, which was uncommon for the time, but perhaps her parents were holding out for a suitable partner for their beautiful, well-connected daughter. In 1800, Delphine married Don Ramon Lopez y Angelo, a former knight of the Royal Order of Charles III. He was now serving as an official for the Spanish lieutenant governor of Louisiana. But he bypassed protocol and married Delphine without the consent of the King of Spain. As a result, he was stripped of his office and ordered to return to the Spanish court. In 1803, the U.S. took possession of Louisiana from France as a result of the Louisiana Purchase. The following year, Don Ramon was pardoned by the Spanish government. It is believed that Delphine traveled to Spain to speak on her husband's behalf and plead for his pardon. They then boarded a ship for America, but Delphine arrived alone. Her husband perished on the way reportedly of a heart attack while on a stopover in Cuba. Delphine was pregnant with their first child and returned to New Orleans to give birth to a daughter, 
that she named Maria Francoise, but was called Borquita by her family. When Borquita was eight years old, Delphine entered into her second marriage. Jean-Pierre Blanc was a wealthy French businessman who was active in New Orleans politics. He and his new wife and stepdaughter resided at 409 Rue Royale, now called Royal Street, and also had a country home called Ville Blanc. At this time, Delphine became one of New Orleans society's most gracious hostesses. Delphine gave birth to four children during her marriage to Blanc, three daughters and a son. Blanc's business dealings were, shall we say, somewhat shady. He made lots of money smuggling goods like coffee and black ivory into the country on private vessels, bypassing customs duties. He also engaged in slave trading. He conducted business with pirates, including the famous Jean Lafitte, who even asked for Blanc's assistant when he was negotiating to help the U.S. Army in the Battle of New Orleans. So perhaps it's not too surprising that Jean Blanc disappeared under mysterious circumstances in 1818. Was he on the run from the law? Did he cross paths with the wrong person in his illegal activities? It is unknown, and there is no record of the date or location of his death. Delphine was then left with four children and no husband, but she had plenty of cash left to her from her husband's estate and continued on quite well without him. She lived as a widow for a decade before marrying again in 1828, this time to another Frenchman, Leonard Louis Lalori. Lalori was a few years younger than his 40-year-old bride. He wasn't very accomplished or well-connected, so it's a bit of a mystery as to why Delphine decided to marry. Well, maybe it's not. They had a son together they named Samuel Arthur Clarence, and it's believed that he was born either before Delphine and LaLaurie married or shortly thereafter. In other words, she became pregnant unexpectedly and married the child's father quickly. LaLaurie attended medical school, and while in most accounts of Delphine's story, he is called doctor, LaLaurie was never a licensed medical doctor. He graduated from dental school, but then opened a medical practice in New Orleans. There's an interesting letter to the editor posted in a New Orleans newspaper in 1825. It asserted that a French physician had arrived in town and was experienced in a new practice of destroying hunches, a surgical procedure that was being successfully employed in France. Supposedly, Dr. Lalaurie, as he began calling himself, could perform an operation to alleviate those who possessed the skeletal deformity then referred to as a hunchback. The letter also stated that LaLaurie had graduated from a medical school in France. Louis and Delphine LaLaurie purchased the mansion at 1140 Royal Street in 1832. At that time, the building was only two stories, not three as it is usually depicted. The third story, as well as the iconic wrought iron balcony, were added sometime after the LaLaurie ownership of the home. Louis LaLaurie's practice, according to invoices discovered in family records, consisted of treating minor ailments like toothaches, everyday illnesses, and non-life-threatening injuries. There are no recorded complaints against the LaLauries for abuse of their slaves. As a matter of fact, there are at least two recorded incidents of petitions the LaLauries made to the court to free a slave in their possession. But there is one court record of abuse, that of Delphine by her husband Louis. In 1832, four years into their marriage, the couple was living apart. Delphine continued to reside at the Royal Street home, while Louis lived in Plaquemines Parish. In October of that year, Delphine charged that Louis had, quote, went so far as to not only ill-treat her, but was to beat and wound her in the most outrageous manner, as to render their living together unsupportable, unquote. For these reasons, she asked the judge to authorize her to sue her said husband for a separation from bed and board. There would be no further record of this case, and it seems that the petition may have been dropped by Delphine as they were living together again at the time of the fire. But two questions emerge from these records. Number one, can we assume that Louis LaLaurie was a violent man that may have had no compunction about abusing his slaves? If he would, according to Delphine, go so far as to beat and wound his own wife, what hesitation would he have had to mistreat those he considered property to be used by him as he wished? 
Secondly, and more terrifying to consider, did his interest in experimental skeletal surgery result in the wounds and mutilations that were rumored to be found on the Lalori slaves? Or were these just wildly embellished tales after the fact? Here's what we do know to be true from newspaper accounts written just a day after the fire, as well as by a deposition given by Judge Conongo and printed in the New Orleans Bee on April 12th. On April 10, 1834, a fire broke out at the Lalori home. Conongo was told once he arrived at the scene that some slaves were chained inside and were in danger of perishing in the fire. He was further informed that the men had asked the Laloris about the slaves, but they were indifferent. In essence, they told them to mind their own business. The men decided to search on their own. Just minutes into the search, one of the men called out, saying he had broken through the bars of a gate that led to another wing of the house. There he could hear the slaves calling for help from inside. The men then broke through another door to reach them. They first found two female slaves. One of them had an iron collar, quote, very large and very heavy, unquote, around her neck, and she was chained with heavy irons by her feet as well. They then reached another room where the second female slave was found. She had a large wound to her head and could barely walk on her own. They then asked Mr. Lalori if there were any other slaves, at which time he made the comment that they would, quote, do better to stay home rather than come into others' homes dictating laws and meddling in their affairs. That was the extent of the witness testimony, and the newspaper account didn't provide much more, although the language hints at the outrage of the witnesses. It states, Upon entering one of the apartments, the most appalling spectacle met their eyes. Seven slaves more or less horribly mutilated were seen suspended by the neck with their limbs apparently stretched and torn from one extremity to the other. Then the article writer wimps out at describing the scene in any detail by stating, Language is powerless and inadequate to give a proper conception of the horror which a scene like this must have inspired. We shall not attempt it, but leave it rather to the reader's imagination to picture what it was. The vagueness of this report may have inspired readers to fill in the blanks, so to speak, and come up with the most horrific imaginings possible to describe the slave's injuries. The head injury on one of the women is reported, but later some would allow their imaginations to run wild, and tales would be told of a festering wound inhabited by maggots, and even that a crude brain experiment was conducted in which the woman's brains had been scrambled with a spoon that was still protruding from the wound. None of this is described anywhere in the official record. But the chaining of the slaves, the conditions they were found in, and the indifference by their owners all led to the public's demonization of Madame LaLaurie in particular. Why she was singled out, we can only speculate. In some later accounts, Louis LaLaurie is reported as not even being present at the time of the fire. Delphine LaLaurie may have been singled out as the most responsible party due to the fact that she was a woman, her family background of wealth and privilege, her role as a socialite, or even because she was considered a great beauty. All these factors make the story more appealing to the masses. The label socialite serial killer, of course not used in the 1800s but popular today, is very catchy. But the slaves did suffer a great deal. Another newspaper account of the day quotes a witness as saying, We saw where the collar and manacles had cut their way into their quivering flesh. For several months they had been confined in those dismal dungeons, with no other nutriment than a handful of gruel and an insufficient quantity of water. It was also reported that one of the women who'd been abused by the Lalauris confessed to setting fire to the house as, quote, the only means of putting an end to her suffering, unquote. Obviously, if she was able to give this statement, then she did not perish in the fire, as later stories claimed. Also, there is no mention of a young girl being killed and buried in the back garden. The entire yard had been excavated after the fire to determine if there were any other victims, and nothing was found. So then, what did happen to Madame LaLaurie? Did she disappear, never to be seen again? Well, no, not exactly. 
She did flee with her husband and son the night of the fire, and the house was destroyed by the mob of angry citizens. But interestingly, while the authorities placed police officers at the mansion to protect the property from being completely razed, it seems they did not waste any manpower on hunting down the Lalores, as they were able to leave town unimpeded. After sailing away, they stayed at a family estate in France. Apparently, Louis was still treating his wife badly, according to a letter that her son Paulin wrote to a family member. His stepfather, he reported, made his mother sleep without a bed and allowed his family to treat his wife cruelly as well. At some point, Delphine and Louis separated, and it is unknown exactly when he died. Delphine LaLaurie made her way to Paris and lived in one of her family's, the McCarty's, homes. With her was her six-year-old son, Jean-Louis, and three of her adult children, her daughters Pauline and Loring, and her son Paulin. It is unlikely that she was in hiding, as she would have been in no danger of being prosecuted in France for crimes that took place in America. She corresponded regularly with her daughter Jeanne in America. Before leaving Louisiana, she gave Jeanne's husband, Auguste Delisus, power of attorney over her financial interests in the States. Delphine Lalori continued to conduct her affairs from France, even giving orders for the repair of one of her properties in New Orleans that was then rented out. Her children knew how damaged her reputation was in America and thought it best that she remained in France. But by 1840, she began writing letters to her son-in-law, making plans to return to New Orleans. No one thought this was a good idea, but she was determined. Her son Paulin sent a letter to Delisus that told of his opposition to his mother's planned return to America. He wrote, She has been thinking about this for a long time, but not knowing what pretext to use in order to realize a project of which the idea alone is a lack of consideration towards her family. I bemoan, as we must all bemoan, the fate that awaits us if ever my mother puts her feet in that country. I truly believe that my mother never had a true idea concerning what the cause of her departure from New Orleans was, since she is thinking of returning." The truth, as painful as it is for a son towards a mother, from her insane project, I will tell her that Pauline and I won't go with her. In the meantime, Delphine returned to New Orleans to live in a recently renovated property located only six blocks from the Royal Street house. It would appear that Delphine LaLaurie really didn't think that what she was accused of in New Orleans was that big of a deal. This makes me think that she may have, in actuality, not cared at all about the abuse she heaped on the poor souls who were enslaved by her and her husband. And if this is the case, it is possible that the rumors of slaves who died and were buried at the mansion might not be that hard to believe. Delphine still possessed great wealth. Tax bills show that she and her brother were the owners of seven pieces of property worth an estimated $138,000 in 1841, or almost $4 million today. While there were rumors of her death in France, one account stating she was gored to death by a wild boar, the truth is she returned to the U.S. and to her property in New Orleans around 1842. Many believed she died in France in late 1842, and her body was returned to Louisiana to be buried because of a discovery made in the early 1900s. A copper plate was found in St. Louis Cemetery No. 1 in New Orleans that read, Madame LaLaurie, née Marie Delphine McCarthy. It stated that she died in Paris on December 7, 1842, at the age of 60-something. The last number is gone as the plate is cracked. But it's been determined that this find was a hoax. Either it was placed there as a ruse to throw people off her tracks on her return to Louisiana, or she had it placed there as a joke. I'm of the opinion that it was a hoax, since her last name is misspelled on the plate, reading McCarthy instead of McCarty. Either way, it has since been discovered that Delphine lived in New Orleans, in a property adjacent to her daughters, until her death in 1857 or 1858. Where she is buried is unknown, but some believe that her remains were most likely interred in the Forstall family tomb in St. Louis Cemetery the family plot of her firstborn daughter, Borkita's husband. But what about the hauntings? 
Well, that, my dear listeners, is another story in of itself. There have been several credible accounts of strange goings-on at 1140 Royal Street throughout its history, and it's had quite a history. We'll pick up the story after the Lalories fled the house in their carriage and sailed out of the country. Their carriage driver was set upon by the mob on his way back into the city. Now, this is terrible, but the horse was killed, the carriage was destroyed, but the driver, by all accounts, was able to get away. I mean, what did the horse ever do? As we know, the police didn't seem that concerned about the Lalories escaping punishment. It seems they were more concerned with protecting their property. And like I said, the property was gutted, but the building still stood and stands today. The house was closed up for a while, and I assume the Lalories negotiated the sale of the property from France. Their agent sold the house to an individual in 1837. The house was then rebuilt in the style and configuration you see today. It was around this time when the third story was added. The new owner only stayed in the house for three months. He claimed to hear strange noises, cries, groans, and shrieks at all hours of the day and night. He then tried renting out rooms in the mansion, but tenants quickly left, and once they shared their belief that the house was haunted, no others wanted to live there. The lower floor was rented out to a couple of businesses in the following years. A furniture store and a barber shop opened, but the businesses failed and the house fell empty once again. It was then said that the building was cursed and no business could succeed there. It remained empty for more than a decade. The Civil War created a need for the house once again. It was rumored that during the war, it was used as a union headquarters by General Butler. Around 1872, during Reconstruction, 1140 Royal Street was opened up as a public school for girls of the lower district. Controversially at that time, both white and black students were enrolled and attended classes together. Two years after the school began operating, a racist group called the White League, that's straight to the point, don't you think, took it upon themselves to desegregate the school. But they had a problem. They couldn't tell some of the white students and the black students apart. There were many mixed-race people in New Orleans, of course, and some of them were more fairly complected than the Caucasian students. The bullies lined up the girls and grilled them about their backgrounds. When they identified a girl as, quote, colored, they forcibly removed her from the school. A year later, it was reopened as a school for black students only. It closed after only one semester. The house was then used as a gambling house, and reports began again about strange happenings inside. Clanking chains were heard, and ghostly apparitions appeared to float in and out of rooms. I'd consider this typical haunted house fair. Of course, there was a lot of drinking going on along with the gambling, so this may have contributed to some of these sightings. In 1876, the house was put up for auction. The ad for the sale stated that the building was well-suited for, quote, a large boarding school, asylum, or boarding house. It also stated it was currently being leased out at $150 per month as a summer rental. In 1882, the mansion was turned into a school of music and dance. A well-known dance instructor from England arrived to head the school, and wealthy New Orleans families sent their children to be instructed there. Just before the first grand recital was to be held, a local paper printed an accusation that the owner had taken liberties with the female students. He was left to wait alone in an empty theater on the night of the recital. Neither students nor guests arrived. The school closed the very next day. Another failed venture. The next story is quite strange. A lone man named Joseph Edouard Vignet rented an apartment in the house for about three years. He kept to himself, and most people considered him a crazy eccentric. One day, black crepe was seen hanging from the doors of the house. He was found dead in his room, which was sparsely furnished with only his cheap and filthy possessions scattered around. As his things were being removed from the apartment, more than $10,000 in cash and heirlooms were found stashed around his rooms. No one ever discovered who had hung the black crepe. In 1893, a man purchased the house in order to capitalize on his reputation. A Mr. F. Greco 
purchased the home and hung posters announcing in both Italian and English the grand opening of the haunted house. He charged 10 cents admission to the curious. In the early 1900s, the house changed owners several times. As immigrants began arriving to America, it was used as a boarding house, its rooms cut up into small apartments to provide cheap rentals. The area became a popular destination for newly arrived Italian immigrants. By 1920, the house was considered a tenement, and there were many reports of ghostly sightings by the residents. There were reports of a ghost carrying its own head. Others described the appearance of a black man wrapped in chains, standing on the stairs. A tenant who was witness to this apparition was too afraid to pass him and stood frozen until the man disappeared like vapor. A woman reported the sighting of a woman in fancy dress standing over her sleeping baby. This woman was seen several times and was believed to be Delphine LaLaurie herself. Many tenants left out of fear and ultimately the building was abandoned once again. From 1923 to 1932, 1140 Royal Street served as the Warrington House for wayward boys. As many as 30 boys at once resided there, locked up for offenses from being runaways to engaging in petty crimes. In the mid-1940s, another proprietor tried his hand at running a business in the mansion. A bar opened up under the name The Haunted Saloon. The owner shared stories of the home and its hauntings and encouraged his patrons to do the same. He kept a log of all the stories he heard. This venture must not have succeeded for long either, because by the 1950s, the building housed a furniture store. And this story might be the most bizarre to come out of the LaLaurie mansion since the fire of 1834. The furniture store, as you may have guessed, did not do well. One day, the owner arrived to find all his furniture ruined. There was a foul-smelling, unidentifiable liquid poured all over the inventory. He suspected vandals must have broken in during the night. He replaced the merchandise, but not long afterwards, once again, found his store ruined as before. He decided to wait in the store with a shotgun one night to catch the perpetrators. He waited in the dark, and when the sun came up, he was astonished to see the foul liquid covering the furniture once again. He closed the store for good soon after. A preservation group worked to save the house from destruction through the 1960s, as it had been a target for looters and vandals for years. Floorboards, tiles, and other period materials were stripped from the house by thieves. An artist, Zella Funk, moved into the house and reported ghost sightings, although she seemed not to consider them scary, but charming. A guest in her home saw a cat in her room, but Funk explained that she did not own a cat. Funk herself would describe a ghost she saw several times. The figure was male, handsome with reddish hair and a beard. He appeared in a full-length mirror. Some believe this may have been the ghost of Louis LaLaurie. The house was later divided into apartments for a time before it was purchased by a retired doctor. He restored the house to its previous grandeur and never reported any paranormal sightings. In 2007, the actor Nicolas Cage purchased the mansion, and lived in the main area of the house, renting out apartments along the back gallery, where the original slave quarters had been. Back in the early 2000s, Cage was snapping up real estate like it was going out of style, even purchasing a couple of castles in Europe. He had the LaLaurie mansion renovated, and it was simply gorgeous when he was finished. I think I would have lived there after he was done with it. Damn the ghosts. It was Trey chic. But Cage, oops must have forgotten about property taxes because after he drained his bank account purchasing, count them, 15 pricey properties at the cost of almost his entire $150 million fortune, he was hit with a tax bill of $6.3 million. Of course, when he couldn't pay, his properties were auctioned off, including the LaLaurie Mansion, which was purchased by a finance company for $5.5 million in 2009. I get it, Nick. I love cool houses, too. The LaLaurie Mansion is now privately owned and is not open for tours. The new owner moved in in 2013 and has refused to allow any filming inside or outside of the house. 
the third season of American Horror Story was based on the story of Madame LaLaurie. And not to burst your bubble, but it was not filmed at the LaLaurie Mansion. In reality, the exterior of the house you see in the show is at the Gallier House Museum, located two buildings over from the LaLaurie Mansion. The interior of the house shown in the series was shot at the Herman Grima House, located on St. Louis Street in the French Quarter. But if you do want to see the inside of the house, I'm going to tell you how you can do it. Ozzy Osbourne was allowed into the house to film and was even allowed to conduct a paranormal investigation. And I'm going to share it with you because I'm a close personal friend of Ozzy's. Just kidding. But if anyone knows him and wants to introduce me, I'd be grateful. Actually, Ozzy has been the only person allowed to visit the house as he was personally invited by the owner. You can see the interior of the gorgeous house Really, it's stunning. On Season 2, Episode 5 of the show Ozzy and Jack's World Tour. You will also hear directly from the owner and the housekeepers about their own experiences inside the house. Of course, now that you know the true story, you'll be able to identify what they got wrong as they recount the history of the mansion. Stories of the hauntings at the LaLaurie Mansion were first widely heard when George Washington Cable, an American novelist and a contemporary of Mark Twain, wrote his book, Strange True Stories of Louisiana, in 1890. He told the story of the 1834 fire factually, and then shared in his story, Haunted House in Royal Street, all the embellished accounts of the monstrous Madame LaLaurie and the tortured and murdered slaves that haunted the property. Then in 1946, Jean Delavine wrote the book Ghost Stories of New Orleans, and it was in her book that the horrifying accounts of the mutilated slaves, including the macabre sex change couple, the human crab, and the lobotomized zombie slave, were first introduced. It's funny how these stories take on a life of their own. Most people now consider these stories to be the true account of what took place at the LaLaurie Mansion in 1834. But I have two more legends that come from the story of Madame LaLaurie to share with you. One is most certainly made up, but the other? Well, perhaps Madame LaLaurie is still with us after all. You be the judge. There is a story that comes out of New Orleans about the devil baby of Bourbon Street. The legend goes like this. The voodoo queen, Marie Laveau, if you don't know about her, look her up. That's a whole nother story. Gave a monstrous devil baby to Delphine LaLaurie. The baby was said to be the spawn of a wealthy Creole woman and a swamp devil. The baby was deformed, with large alien-like eyes and two small horns protruding from the top of its head. It screamed and shrieked incessantly. The baby was baptized, with Delphine standing in as its godmother. Laveau needed someone to help her raise the child, and Delphine found the baby amusing, so she agreed. It was kept in a dark room at the back of her house. Delphine treated the baby like an entertaining pet and fed it bits of bloody, raw meat. When the fire broke out and the Laloris fled, Delphine was forced to leave the baby behind. It was unknown if the devil baby died in the fire or if it was responsible for the scratching and scuttling noises heard in the first days after the house was abandoned. In either case, the devil baby is said to still haunt the house. There are no surviving images of Delphine LaLaurie. All we have are written accounts from her day that describe her as uncommonly beautiful. A gentleman who once lived in the LaLaurie mansion commissioned a painted portrait of Madame LaLaurie because he wanted a likeness of her to put up on the wall of the home to honor its infamous history. New Orleans artist Ricardo Pustanio painted the now-famous red and black portrait of Madame LaLaurie in 1997. It's the image you will most commonly see if you do a search for Delphine LaLaurie. But not long after it was finished, it also gained a reputation for being haunted. The owner of the painting invited guests to come and see it and also allowed paranormal investigations and seances to be held in his home. During these events, the painting would be seen rocking on the wall and at times even coming loose and falling to the floor. The owner then began to experience other things in the house, the smell of smoke 
and objects being moved around on their own. Footsteps were often heard overhead when no one else was home. He became afraid of having the painting near him and gave it to another tenant. That tenant then experienced a feeling like someone was in the room with her and felt like Madame LaLaurie's eyes in the painting were following her. She felt cold hands touch her and even heard whispers coming from the painting. Finally, the painting was returned to the artist, who found a new owner for it. The new owners still have possession of the painting, and it now hangs in another residence. They have declined to comment on the painting or be interviewed. The portrait of Madame Delphine LaLaurie is now known as The Haunted Painting. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime, and that will wrap up the series Haunted Homicide. I hope you enjoyed it, and I wish you all a safe and fun Halloween. And watch out for ghosts and goblins and things that go bump in the night. I won't have an episode out next Monday, since it's the fifth Monday of the month, but I will have a bonus episode up midweek. On that episode, you will hear my interview with Jeffrey Reinick, the FBI agent whose serial killer Carrie Stainer confessed to about his crimes in 1999. I covered that case in Season 2, Episode 46, Murder in Paradise, The Yosemite Murders. If you haven't listened to that one yet, you may want to do that before hearing the inside story. Jeff Reinick gives details about the Carrie Stainer case that haven't been shared before. You won't want to miss it. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. My admin assistant is Lorena Garcia, and our copy editor is Crystal Dernan. Until next time, be good to one another. <laughs>